If you have your Bibles, would you open up with me to Luke chapter 6? We're going to be in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. Um, Martin did a broader overview of this last week, and what we're going to do today is we're going to dive in a little bit deeper on each of these beatitudes and woes and understand what they're saying to us. Um, I'll remind you that this is likely a different set of beatitudes than what we find in Matthew. There's different opinions on that, but um, what we're we're suggesting to you is that um, this isn't Matthew and Luke being confused or, or misremembering things. Um, what actually is probably happening is that Matthew and Luke are telling stories of two different teachings. And so uh, Matthew's gospel has eight beatitudes, and Luke has four beatitudes paired with four woes or curses. And so today we're going to look at these two sets of four, and they come in pairs, and understand what they're saying to us today about happiness. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will read together. Father, your word is a light into our feet and a lamp into our path. So, Father, we ask that you would light the way for us this morning. Show us your way, show us your truth, and show us how we can live holy and righteous lives before you in light of the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, illuminate this word by your Holy Spirit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 20. And Jesus lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So are you happy? I hope that most of you might be able to say yes sometimes, maybe. But it's a fact of life that that sometimes we're unhappy. Some things don't go our way. So what I did this week, because we were were talking about happiness, that's what blessedness is, we're talking about happiness. What I did this week is I got on Google and I looked up how to be happy. Now several things popped up, but this one, what I'm about to read to you is the first result I saw And it caught my attention because it's from the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. So this is a a government-backed, by the United Kingdom, but government-backed prescription for happiness. So there's five steps they give you. Here they are. One, manage your stress levels. Two, enjoy yourself. Three, boost your self-esteem. Four, have a, happy, have a healthy lifestyle. And five, talk and share with friends. Now, that's not half bad advice. But if you're anything like me, you see that, and there's something deeply unsatisfying about it. This is the prescription that the world gives for happiness. But it doesn't it doesn't deal with the real problems of life. What if I can't manage my stress levels because of I'm in the middle of a a tragedy tragedy in my family? What if my healthy lifestyle 
is hindered by a terminal illness? What if I'm lonely and I don't have anyone to talk and share with? The internet is filled with articles and blogs like this. Books have been written like this. And they all present as if they've found the pathway to eradicating sorrow, to having eternal, lasting happiness. But happiness doesn't work that way. It's not five easy steps. And in fact, happiness is very hard to find. All the books, all the blog posts in the world, no matter how wise their advice, can't solve the problem, the devastating problem of human suffering. There's no solution here for our deepest, most serious problems. And so the question for us is, is there something more? Well, today, I'm arguing that there is. You can have true happiness, and you can have happiness that is lasting. And the prescription for true happiness comes from Jesus. So first, we're going to do, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to look at happiness biblically, defining it, understanding what it is, and asking the question, ultimately, what does Jesus think happiness is? And then we'll look at the way to achieve happiness, because Jesus gives us three key pathways that answer for us what happiness, what, how we can achieve happiness. So first, what is happiness? Uh, Martin mentioned this last week, but in Hebrew and Greek, there are two words for blessed. Hebrew, it's bara versus asher. Greek, it's uh, makarios versus yulagetos. Don't worry about those. What you need to know, though, is that one word for blessing is about declarative pronouncements. So at the end of the service, Dean is going to come up here, and he's going to raise his hands over you, and he's going to pronounce a blessing, which is, by the way, why we lift our heads. We don't, it's not a prayer. It's, it's something that we're receiving. But this is a, a promise, a declaration, something that is coming from God to us. And so these kinds of blessings are what we see like in number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. They're promises, they're declarations. In Matthew six, or in Luke six, and particularly in the Beatitudes, the other word appears later, we get the Makarios language. And this is something different. It's not declarative, it's observational where one is declared over a person, given to a person, the other is simply a statement of fact. And so Jesus is stating a fact about these people. That's why we can, that's why we can translate this word, blessed, sometimes we can translate it as happiness. So in other words, strictly speaking, Jesus is not blessing his disciples as a priest over them. There's some of that going on, but that's not the primary thing that he's doing. Instead, he is making statements of observational fact. These people are happy. It's not a wish for them to be happy. It's not a promise for them to be happy. It is that they are happy. But astute readers, which I assume some of you are, will notice a problem. There's a sense in which Jesus' words are demonstrably false. It looks like he's lying. Because he says, the poor the hungry and the weeping are blessed. But in what world are the poor, the hungry, and the weeping characterized by happiness and blessedness? In fact, this word that Jesus is using, makarios, in, in Koine Greek, it, it's normally applied to rich people because rich people are unworried. They have no needs, all their needs are met. And so this is normally applied to rich people. And so Jesus is turning around what this word means. He's turning around the world's meaning of happiness, and he's saying, no, the people who are truly happy, people that are really happy, are those who are poor and hungry and weeping. But we still haven't gotten quite to the bottom of what happiness is. I can tell you what it's not. And we're filled to the brim with, with, hap with view faulty views of what happiness is. You know, everybody has their, their own idea. But the Bible followed by the near unanimous consent of Christians throughout history, has a very clear answer. And you actually know it. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. 
And so there's a relationship between God's glory, our happiness, and our ultimate purpose. In other words, true happiness, true joy, true beatitude is, is found in achieving our end and in achieving our purpose. And for all of us, that purpose, that aim, that end is God's own glory. And that's why Jesus' Beatitudes seem so backwards. By the world's standards, happiness involves being rich and full and laughing. It means enjoying the pleasures of the world, filling our bellies with food, our mouths with laughter, and enjoying worldly pleasures. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with those things. There's nothing inherently wrong with laughter, with enjoyment, with food, with even wealth. But our ultimate happiness doesn't consist in these Epicurean delights, these fleshly, earthly delights. Instead, Jesus calls us to throw those things off in pursuit of a higher calling. Now, this is really hard. And as the Beatitudes demonstrate, it will necessitate very real suffering. Hunger is suffering. Poverty is suffering. But the promise of Jesus is that if we endure these small sufferings and these small sorrows, there's a greater reward and a greater joy in heaven. So what what is happiness? Happiness is our dogged pursuit of God's own glory and righteousness. Happiness ultimately looks somewhere else for joy. It looks up to God and his glory because everything else is fleeting. And everything else ultimately serves that end. Happiness is pursuit of God. So, next question, how do we do that? Well, following Jesus' instructions, I want to give you three simple and practical ways to find happiness. First, rest in God's kingdom. Second, hope in the future. And third, look to the past. Rest in God's kingdom, hope in the future, and look to the past. So first, rest in God's kingdom. Look at verses 20 and 24. Remember, we're looking, these are four sets of four, or four sets of two. So there's four blessings and four woes that pair together. And so we'll look at the first blessing and first woe. Jesus says in verse 20, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. In verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now, if you're paying attention, one of the first things you'll notice about these is that these statements are in the present tense. That's not the case for the others. You'll notice the second and third blessings are in the future tense. You will be satisfied. You will laugh. You shall laugh. But this one says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the woe, the curse, is even more emphatic. Most English translations, and this is a good translation, say you have, you have received your consolation. But it may be even better to translate it as you receive or you are receiving your consolation. In any case, the idea is that the comfort that the rich have is currently present with them in this very moment. And the kingdom of God is currently present with the poor in this moment. Now, Jesus isn't condemning wealth per se. Wealth in itself is good. It is better to be wealthy than it is to be poor, and that's an objective reality. But what Jesus is condemning here is the pursuit of wealth as an end in itself. The pursuit of riches as an end in itself is our ultimate goal. Now, on the other hand, If we pursue God instead of comfort and wealth, we are promised not just future hope, but blessing and happiness now in the midst of our trials. Even in unhappy circumstances, we have access to eternal happiness. Even when we're mired with poverty and emptiness, we have the eternal riches of communion with God. So the question for you is, where is your comfort? Do you rest in God's kingdom, or do you rest in your riches? It's no secret that we live and the world's richest country. Now, some people are giving us a run for, their, for um, 
our money. That was not an intended pun, but even our, even some of the poorest among us live in comfort relative to the rest of the world. But even among most of us in this room, we're far beyond that. Now, your material wealth, again, is not a bad thing. But it may very well put you in spiritual danger. When we get in trouble, where's the first place we run? For a lot of us, the first place we run to is our checkbook. Because money can fix a lot of problems. Our first impulse is to turn to our bank accounts. Now again, it may come to that point, and God may actually use our wealth as a means to achieve his purposes. But if we rely on that, if we take comfort in that, if we rest in that, we are in spiritual danger. We may find ourselves receiving comfort now and missing it in the future. So find your comfort in him first. Rest in God's kingdom. And you can have happiness no matter what your material circumstances are. Those things are fleeting, and they're a means to an end. So let them stay as that. Let them stay as a means to an end and seek first the kingdom of God. Rest in God's kingdom. Second, hope for the future. Let's look at verses 21 and 25. Verse 21, blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And then verse 25, woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Now, the verses in our Bible are not original. Um, they were put into the Bible in about the 1500s, around the time of the Reformation. But uh, sometimes we have issues with them, we can disagree. But in this particular case, I think whoever did the versification of this passage was, was astute. They knew what they were doing. The second and third Beatitudes and the second and third woes are connected by parallelism. You have the emphatic now, and you have the future tense in both of those. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Who, who weep now, who laugh now, who are full now. So you remember how the first statements were in the present tense, highlighting the present situation, but these are in the future tense with this emphatic now. And so if the first beatitude and the first woe, in, in those, Jesus is pointing out the fact that the end is now. He's bringing forward the heavenly reality to us. What he's doing in the second and third Beatitudes is actually dividing, showing the distinction between our current situation and where we will be. Instead of bringing present and future together, he shows a distinction between them. So theologians like to describe this. Sometimes we come up with fancy words. Other times we uh, use simple words. This one's a simple one. Uh, the phrase that we use to describe this is, is already not yet. Already not yet. And what theologians get at when they're using that word is the idea that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is clearly present to us now. We experience that every Sunday when we join in the heavenly chorus to worship together, right? And Jesus has already ascended to his throne and is ruling even as we speak. But the church lives in an in-between time. Because while we're able to participate in that now, we don't have the full fulfillment of it, the complete fulfillment of it. And we await a fuller and better and more perfect communion with God in the future. We all still sin. We all still deal with suffering. We all still deal with struggle. But what Jesus is pointing us to is a future hope and a future rest. In the first beatitude, Jesus points to our present hope, but he doesn't deal with what we should do explicitly with our suffering. This is what he does in the second and third beatitudes. The answer to our suffering is hope. Yes, we can, have, we can be happy in the midst of our trials, but our trials are not eternal. They have an end. 
They have a stopping point. And if we are happy in our trials and in our sufferings now, Jesus promises, that, promises us that those things will pass away, they will be done away with, and we'll have an even greater happiness and comfort and joy in heaven. On the other hand, for those who are receiving their comfort now, there is no comfort in heaven. And so this, this is one of the great mysteries of the faith. One of the great paradoxes of Christianity. Our suffering now produces joy in the future. That's what Jesus' life is all about. That's why when Jesus was in Gethsemane, he asked his father to take the cup of wrath away, but his father would not relent. Why? Because the economy of God's grace is an economy of atonement and affliction. We talked about Philippians 2 last week, and we, we sang Philippians 2 last week. But it bears revisiting. Because Paul tells us that while Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it is for that reason. It's not because Jesus is God. It's not because he's all-powerful. It's not because he's the son of his father, although those things are related. The central primary reason for Jesus' kingship and his exaltation is his suffering and death. What does that mean for us? Well, on, on this side of the cross, Jesus' gives our Jesus suffering gives our suffering meaning. Yes, he saves us from our sin, but even beyond that, his suffering on this earth models for us what it means to have true happiness. In order to be exalted, in order to be lifted up with Jesus, we must first be humbled. And this brings God the highest glory. We don't often think like that, do we? I think this is particularly hard for parents to swallow. You know, we want our kids to be, to be happy and healthy and we want our kids to go to a good college and get a good job and, you know, have a nice, comfortable income. We, it's easy to tell our kids to be nice to people and to stay out of trouble, but if that's all following Jesus is, is being nice and staying out of trouble, then there's nothing special about what we're doing here. You might as well go home and eat brunch. What Jesus is actually calling us to, and calling our children to, is a life of humility and sacrifice and suffering. So what are our motivations? Are we motiva motivated by the things of this world? Because if, if that's what we're seeking, and if that's what we're inviting our children and our friends and our family into, we're going to be full now. We're going to be happy now, but we're going to lose out on the eternal reward. It is far too easy to put on a Christian veneer and never deal with matters of the heart. It is far too easy to outwardly look like a nice Christian person who goes to church occasionally and does all those things, but who's never actually dealt with God in their hearts. It's very easy to look humble and look contrite over our sin, but to have <laughs> bellies that are full with the pleasures of this world. But the way to true happiness is taking on a humble heart, a heart of submission to God, and enduring the reviling and the pain and the suffering of the world with faith in our future hope. So hope in the future. And that brings us to our third point. Look to the past. Look at verses 22 and 26. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. In verse 26, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. So to drive home Jesus' point about the present, 
reality of our happiness now and the future reality of our happiness then, Jesus points back to the past. He talks about the prophets and the false prophets. In, in Greek, it's prophets and pseudo-prophets. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this general pattern. The prophets of God, the ones that, who actually hear from God and who actually proclaim his word, are the ones who suffer. Jeremiah, for example, was thrown into a well. They, they go through all sorts of, of horrific and terrible suffering, and those are the ones who are the true prophets of God. It's the false prophets who get to sit in the comfort of the royal courts. Verse 26 in particular has an important twist. It says, Woe to you when all people speak well of you. That's the goal of a false prophet. They seek to be well regarded by everyone. Now, there are different ways it's played out in history, but generally the way the false prophets gained their standing, gained the ability to be well spoken of, was by tickling ears, by telling the king what he wanted to hear, by telling the king good omens, you know, the prophets of God would say, you need to repent of your sin or you're going to be destroyed. The false prophets would say, oh, no worries. Everything is okay. We're going to win all the wars. And the king liked to hear one more than the other, I imagine. Kings don't like to be told they're wrong. So they surround with themselves with people who puff them up. That's what the false prophets did. And that's what our rulers do today as well. If you want to be regarded, well regarded by all people, well regarded in the world, all you got to do is be subject to every whim of the world. Like Psalm 1 says, be blown about by the breeze, like chaff in the wind. This is a, a great way to win elections. This is a great way to win prestige. You see this all the time with elected leaders. Our elected leaders, you just go back and check some of the people, some of the views that our leaders had 10, 15 years ago. You can see total 180 degree changes because elections are more important. And they surround themselves with people who encourage and protect them through that. So I, I, I say all of this to show you this. There will be days, and there have been days, where Christians and Christian doctrine and Christian life will be well spoken of. There will also be days when Christians and Christian life and Christian doctrine will be reviled and the name of Jesus will be spat out and reviled. The problem is not the specific situation. Instead, we run into trouble when the world changes around us and we're still well spoken of. If the world changes around you, if you're seeing the world change, if you're seeing the world fall into sin, fall into despair, if you're seeing your people commit grave sins, and they still think you're great, you might have a problem. The temptation to shift and to turn and to change is strong, but Jesus points us actually back to what God did with the prophets. Just to give you one example, you'll remember the prophet Elijah. He spent most of his time at odds with King Ahab, who had married a foreign Baal worshiper. He spent many days in exile in the wilderness, and he spent many days begging God, asking him, why have you done this to me? Why have you called me to be your prophet just to send me out into the wilderness to, to die, to be alone? The prophets of Baal, on the other hand, were able to sit in the king's court, enjoy rich food, rich drink, and give him great words of hope. They just sat there and told the king, you know, if you sacrifice to Baal, everything will be okay. There will be no problems. Everything will be fine. But Elijah slept in a cave and in fear. Now, if that were the whole story, we would have reason to despair. We, we, but we know the end. The prophets of Baal and their queen Jezebel, despite their great standing among men, were eventually thrown down to death. Queen Jezebel was ripped apart. But Elijah 
was lifted up to eternal hope, never having experienced even the pain of death by God's mercy. So Elijah and others like him serve as an example for us. We may suffer at the hands of men, but God has vindication for us. God has hope for us. James tells us, quoting scripture, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So take heart, and in particular, take heart in the works of God, his covenant faithfulness through the generations. Know your Bible and know these stories. Know how God has worked. Study his works and put your hope in him. See how the saints of God have struggled under the threat of the kingdoms of this world and have come out on the other side victorious in the Lord. Learn how they stood strong and learn how their trust and their faith in God endured. And if you follow their example, you can join them in eternal happiness. Look to the past. Those are your three steps to happiness from Jesus. Rest in God's kingdom, hope in the future, and look to the past. What's, what's your prescription for suffering? When trials come, when temptation comes, what do you do? Do you run to worldly pleasures? Do you run to your checkbook? Do you run to uh, the joys the, the, of pleasures of this world, food and drink and laughter? Or do you turn to God? You know, the Heidelberg Catechism, we don't, we don't use the Heidelberg Catechism here, but it's a famous Reformed um, confession. It says, what is my only comfort in life and death? My only comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but that I belong body and soul to my Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong to Jesus, and his words are hard. He doesn't give us an easy way out, but at the same time, he also tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Some of the hardest things, some of your hardest struggles that you endure in this life will come as a direct result of your faithfulness to Jesus. Preeminent in that will be your own struggle against sin and your desire for holiness. But God provides a way. God promises happiness and hope. And as the psalmist says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy, true happiness, true peace comes in the morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.